It's Gordon. It's LaShawn. Back with another episode on the Public Health Insight Podcast. LaShawn, you there? You there? What's wow. Up, what's up? Sometimes <laughs> these days where you're so busy, I don't even know if you're gonna turn up on the other end. The last time I was okay. you left me talking by myself, talking to myself by myself in a very quiet basement space. Yeah. You did a good job, fam. Okay. All good. Well, it's a bit of a continuation on this episode because last time we talked about, well, I talked about the core competencies in public health, right? And my opinions on whether they might be useful or not as written, right? One of my biggest challenges with them is that it relies on like a self-assessment. So you, you read this document of what the core competencies and skills across the different domains and you're like, oh, yeah, I'm good at that. I'm good at that. But how do we standardize the way we think about public health skills? Should we have a standardized test? Right. Many other disciplines and professions, regulated health professionals and clinicians, they have like a regulated body that administers a test and they have to do that test to be able to practice. Right. Should public health have something like that? And that's exactly what we're going to be talking about and like maybe we already do maybe there's something like that out there already right maybe maybe so there we go you're listening to the public health insight podcast your go-to space for all things public health and global health from the sustainable development goals to the social determinants of health as well as interesting dialogues about the diverse career opportunities that exist in these fields Remember to subscribe to the podcast and leave us a rating on Apple Podcasts and Spotify so other people like you can benefit from our content. Do we need a standardized test, Sean? I think we're people that are very kind of self-critical and follow industry trends and try to excel at different things. So I think we're naturally inclined for the continuing education piece, but in principle, right, once you get a master of public health, for example, or an, or an equivalent graduate degree, you don't really have to upskill. Nothing is holding you accountable to really upskill once you get your graduate degree. So that could be problematic. I think before we answer that question, we just need to hmm. talk it through a bit because I feel like there's so many different components oh, to that question, okay. right? Like to your point hey, we got our MPH, why do we need to mm. potentially do something else? We're already considered uh, to have competencies for mm. public health. Why do more? So let's start a mm. bit back. We have these other professions like nursing, medicine, pharmacy. They have like sort of board exams and credentials that they need to get and obtain in addition to their degree that they may get at mm. a formal university. And when I think about public health in that context, it's kind of much different, right? When, you're, when you work in public health, you ask someone, hey, what work do you do in public health? You can expect a variety of different answers. It's not, I'm a nurse or I'm a doctor. It's, uh, I'm a coordinator for infectious disease or I work on environmental protocols or I'm an epidemiologist or, you know, so the list goes on and on. And so... Thinking about some of this work and some of that justification for even needing some sort of certification, let's start there. And what I always think about is some of the work done by Greenwood and Friedson in 1970 when they were talking about different characteristics mm. of a profession. And I'm going to list some of them out and then we could talk about each one. But the first one is formal education and training are required for membership in this profession, a.k.a. Hmm. maybe an MPH or a bachelor's of public health. Number two, there are regional or national associations. So as we know in Canada, we have many different public health associations and same with uh, the U.S. Number three, there's a code of ethics. Number four, there is a body of scientific knowledge and technical skill required. Number five, the members function with a degree of autonomy and authority under the assumption that they are alone and have the expertise to make informed decisions in their area of competence. And finally, number six, credentialing is required, reflecting community sanction or approval. So what do you think about those? 
one to one to six, really. I know there's actually an argument to be made that one and five are already covered for the most part. And six is kind of that gap that we're talking about mm. today, the credentialing. Yeah, right. Because I think the, the reality is there's all these different curriculums by these different schools to develop these master of public health programs or equivalent. And that training is usually sufficient for you to go out in the real world and maybe get an entry level position or if you already have some experience to get your first job after that. But what we're really talking about is what happens beyond that year or two years as practice starts to change. What happens when even the, if you observe or compare curriculums from different schools, different countries, and all the differences there, as it probably should be given the local context, right? Mm -hmm. You're missing out on, you, you have a variety and a variation of practices that in essence could be a good thing, but when you don't have a standardized set, you, you must, there must be able to come up with a standardized set of practices, acknowledging that there can be some variation mm -hmm. around the edges. And I think that's what you're yeah. getting at, too, when you compare like nursing, other health professionals who are trained, then there, there's a standardized assessment to assess your competency. If you fail, you then have to retest before you're even allowed to work. So if you think about even from an employer perspective, we're talking about a lot of times that we talk about project management professional, and that's really cool. But as an employer... Mm -hmm. If there's a body out there that administers an exam for me and the person could provide proof of having a credential in public health, that does a lot of work for me already in terms of like what types of assessments I might want to do myself or if I can trust that they're truly competent. Right. So I think there's there's mm -hmm. something definitely to be said for your point number six about what what makes a profession. Yeah. And we call ourselves public health professionals after all. Like, what does that even mean? Right. Yeah. Yeah, there's so much uh, variation. So many, there's so many. so many variations that you could kind of think of. And again, with the skill sets around the edges there, they can be different, job specific, right? But I think, as you mentioned in the previous episode, with some of those core competencies, there are skills across the board right. that would enhance your practice. And right, and then, do, and then right? this is a part that I always find interesting. So you know when you have a, someone might do a resume and they just list a bunch of skills on a resume. And it's like, am I just supposed mm. to take your word that you're like, yeah, you're proficient in like quantitative data analysis, for example? Yeah. Imagine like a nurse applying and just says, good at giving injections. Like, yeah, you better be because you got licensed to be a nurse. Mm. So I can assume that you have the requisite skills to practice as a nurse. Whereas in the public mm. health professional, realm we're still relying on people to kind of self-report skills that they're good at and that's that can get a little bit in the way sometimes yeah and and you've kind of already hit on some of the the main points for even wanting to have a credentialing mm. type system for public health so some of those common reasons are you know protecting the public's interest of course you want to make sure that everyone who claims they're a public health professional have that standardized skill set and uh, mm. are qualified mm. to do the work that they're doing. Uh, the second is creating a common body of knowledge across the profession. Again, so many different and so many variations of public health work. Are there some things that can be pulled across each of those things? Uh, you know, differentiating between those are cert who are certified and not certified. And to your point, assisting employers in mm. making those hiring decisions, mm -hmm. right? So all this in public health, we're thinking about all these different things like formal education, your, your experiences, the work that you do, the volunteering opportunity you do. Is there a spot mm. for credentialing mm. in public health? Are we closer to answering the question well, yet, Gordon? We have a lot of competencies already, right? So in Canada... Mm -hmm through the Public Health Agency of Canada, and they're doing work to update those. In the States, there's a, a renewed set of competencies that were published in 2021. And they also, yeah. I think a few decades ago, you can correct me if I'm wrong on the exact date, 
a lot of these discussions have happened in the United States about credentialing for public health professionals. And there has been yeah. an, essentially a body set up to administer that certification. So we're not starting at ground zero here. There's work that's already been done. I guess the question now becomes, I know we'll get into the, what this agency is and their mandate, but the question now becomes scaling that. Like, is there is it feasible to mandate, for example, because what we're talking about is, after all, a voluntary credentialing system mm. for public health professionals currently. Yeah. Other fields have yeah. a mandatory credentialing system, right? Uh, the doctors, yeah. uh, pharmacists, nursing, etc. And how does that become scaled and should it be mandatory? That's a question. But yeah, to, w the United States, uh, of, of all the countries that I'm aware of anyway, have a system in place. What does that look like? Yeah. Well, first of all, in Canada, I know there were preliminary discussions many years ago about mm. creating yeah. some sort of credential uh, in public health, but I, I'm not sure. I think priorities may have changed for right now, so it hasn't been well established yet. But as you mentioned, in the U.S., uh, there have been a bunch of different associations. So uh, we all know the American Public Health Association, the Association of Prevention, Teaching, and Research, Association of Schools and Programs of Public Health, Association of State and Territorial oh, we had them on Health the Officials. Yeah, Gordon, yeah, you're yeah. familiar with them. And the National Association of County and City Health Officials. Those are kind of the co-founding partners. And basically, they work together. They've had many discussions, extensive planning discussions with all of them. And in 20, 2005, they created something called the NBPHE which stands for the National Board of Public Health Examiners, and it's an independent organization, and they basically want to ensure that public health professionals have mastered mm. foundational knowledge, skills, relevant to contemporary public health practice. And they, within that organization, the NBPHE, they created a credential called the Certified in Public Health Credential, which... Mm. To date, over 14,000 public health mm. professionals have successfully passed right. the associated exams and are thereby allowed to use the credentialing of certified mm. in public health beside their name and on their resume and for the work that they do in public health. And so, yeah, just to be clear, as of right now, it's a national association, meaning that the majority of people that have this credential are in mm -hmm. the U.S. However, there are many people as well outside the U.S. who want to add this to their professional development and practice, and they opt to take that mm -hmm. voluntary exam, as you say. So speaking of voluntary, though, I think there are, so there are schools, right, it, or I could say yeah. academic institutions that are... C for credited, so certified education in public health or something like that, accredited. <laughs> and some of those schools, correct me if I'm wrong, actually some of them might mandate their students to do the exam as part of graduating, right? But that's not very common, but that's a case for some schools at least, as far as I'm aware. Is that a potential avenue to like scaling that up where you write that exam as part of leaving. Obviously, you're busy with your capstone, your thesis, and you probably mm -hmm. want to punch someone if you don't graduate soon enough. But And then now you're going to have to study for a month or so to pass the CPH. I actually mm -hmm. probably would have valued it personally if it was sort of built into leaving my program versus like having to do it as a separate thing. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, no, you raise a great point. There are many schools in mm. Canada and especially the U.S. that are classified Council. as Council on Education of Public Health mm. accredited schools. And again, for example, Western University, shout out mm. to Western University, whose MPH program is also one of the few CIF accredited programs in Canada. And you're right. Not necessarily Western, but there are many schools. I think there are 
probably around mm. 13 schools from what I've read that actually mm. require you to pass this CPH exam as a part mm-hmm. of their final examination in the program. And to your point, yes, like I think it potentially doesn't require yeah. extra beyond what you learn studying yeah. because yeah. yeah, what you learn should be a pretty good start in yeah. terms of what you need to know to pass that exam. But yeah, like I think that's actually part of uh, the NBPHE's mm. strategy on bringing more awareness to the certification, working with their partners and working with CIF accredited schools across mm. the world to <laughs> convince the programs that, hey, this is a valuable certification, there is value to this, and students coming out of their programs in addition to their MPH, their DRPH, mm. with the CPH are going to be more valued in the workforce mm. by their employers. I wish, sincerely, that instead of doing the internal exams that we had to do, that it just made us do the CIF <laughs> exam. Because then that's so much useful, yeah. more useful once you leave the program. Yeah. We did health economics, yeah. informatics, and all these types of exams, yeah. statistics and epidemiology. I would have much rather put my yeah. energy into preparing for the CIF as part of that program. And I know I know they have their own... Well, be careful what you I, wish for, I mean, buddy. I'm out of it now, so I'm not... Be I don't, careful what the, you the, wish The future <laughs> students have to reap my, the repercussions of my yeah. statement. But yeah, it, it just would have been more mm-hmm. practical. I think it's a tough sell right now to then go back and do it when... Maybe your career is advancing yeah. really well already and maybe you've gotten your first job. Maybe you're busy and it's really hard to go back in time yeah. to then do it. It Absolutely. should be a part of your education, I think. Yeah, especially if you're yeah. all happy with your trajectory. There's no need to go back. I would say just from the program's perspective, one of the reasons why you mm. wouldn't want to do that necessarily would be, hey, what if students <laughs> fail that exam? Do they get held back another yeah. year? I think from a program perspective, they're oh, probably yeah. like, I don't like that. that. I don't like the fact yeah. that they don't have control over um, graduating, for example. So, yeah, that's, that's just a quick reason. Or, or even a, but, an uh, in-betweener, sure like a, a pathway to get there where it's not like it's embedded yeah. as a voluntary thing, you know, where you can mm. like, yeah. You know. And and I do think that many schools mm. do promote it, yeah. especially in the U.S. They okay. promote it alongside the coursework. Hey, like you're yeah, wrapping up, cool. you're coming to the end of your program. Consider doing this. You're eligible to write this exam because you're coming from a C for credit school, for example. Uh, yeah, might yeah, as well yeah. do it now, right? So you find some people taking that. I would have done it if well. they hyped it up more, I think. Yeah. But now it's a tough sell. Yeah, I yeah. think a lot of people would have. I think a lot of people would have. But at the same time, as this credential is kind of gaining validity in the field and gaining more value and respect through employers and different partners in public health, I think we're potentially in the future going to get to a point where schools, for example, will be able to be like, hey, you actually Mm. need this because job postings are saying we need Mm. CPH certified uh, public health professionals to apply to this job, for example. So I think this is some this mm-hmm. is a trend we might see going forward and i think in the us especially there've also been many indications that job postings are adding cph requirements and there are a bunch of partner organizations that mm-hmm. actually have that listed as a requirement to apply there you go we talked about how in a, in some cases anyway that you could be coaxed or encouraged to write the cph exam upon graduation yeah. or something that you yeah. pursue on your own. However, an MPH is sort of widely accepted as that certification in public health, in a sense, right? Mm-hmm. But there are people out there who have been doing public health work who don't have an MPH and maybe don't even have a bachelor yeah. in public health either. Is this something that can give people in that position a little bit more credibility from a credential side. Obviously, they have the experience on their resume to back it up, but maybe not the credentials. So if, if they're not looking to go mm-hmm. back to through a formal education process, is a CPH credential something that they can pursue? Are they eligible for it? it like, how does that work? Yeah, I mean, I don't think anyone has the answer right now, but I think it's a potential avenue to gain more public health legitimacy, Mm. if you will, within a space, especially if you don't have 
formal academic credentials, which by no means is indicative of your performance as a mm-hmm. practitioner in public health, by the way, but for the purpose of showcasing some credentials mm-hmm. to say, hey, this shows that I meet and maintain national standards in public health and shows a commitment to continuing education focused on public health and those emerging contemporary issues, it's a it's really a mark to show employers, hey, like, in addition to my experience, mm. this is my mm. commitment as well, and this is kind of the overall package. So the value, I guess, is we'll find out more in the future about how this ends up, but in theory, it's supposed to mm. act as that mark and that kind of standard to show that if you're hiring this individual, they they kind of have this understanding of this common body of knowledge. They have this understanding of the ethics right. in public health and they have skills and all the competencies required to engage in effective public health practice. So yeah, it's, it's definitely an option. So what, what are your thoughts on, so this is getting back to that question on should there be a standard test for public health professionals? I think we see the yeah. value in something they're evaluating mm. and assessing the performance of people to signify competency before going out in the work world, especially when in public health. So obviously you have public health professionals as a broad category of workers. And then within that, you have yeah. biostatisticians, epidemiologists, data analysts. Yeah. And I think, I, I believe something like an epidemiologist should have some kind of standardized testing whether it's through the CPH Mm -hmm. that we just talked about or a subspecialization through a CPH exam, just like how you have uh, MPH degrees where you have a specialization in something. Because those are a very specific set of technical skills that should be accessible. Like there should be something out there to be able to assess someone's competency before you go around calling yourself an epidemiologist. And it shouldn't be the judge. yeah. If you get a job that's an epidemiologist, that in of itself to me doesn't mean that you're a competent epidemiologist. Good. Like congratulations on the job. But that's a very technical mm. job that to me requires yeah. some skills testing in an objective way. And then for my so from my yeah. perspective, the field of public health, especially for those technical roles, could benefit from a standardized testing process, in my opinion. Yeah. Which is why you see that when you apply for a job like an epidemiologist or a biostatistician, they often ask you to right. do some technical tests, right. right? Ahead of even being hired, right? They want to assess that because you can't really pull that out of a resume or cover letter or interview necessarily, right? So yeah, there's definitely some justification for even niching down even more and mm. you know epidemiology certification or whatnot. But for the context of this conversation at least, Let's mm. round up all the troops, so many different members of the public mm. health workforce. Should there be a unifying credential that marks public health practitioners? Gordon, are you more ready to answer that question? I would say question? yes. There are some things that are common across the board, like interpreting data, communicating findings, program planning, evaluation, a bit, bit of research knowledge, a knowledge on the history of public health. I think there there yeah. are many things that can be standardized where no matter what someone's subspecialty is, it should be an expectation yeah. that they have those skills. So I think for that reason, I would be for some kind of standardized testing that's applied, whether it's a, a national level, regional level, international, mm-hmm. some kind of standardizing and, and some kind of uh, standardized and consistent credential that more globally can serve as a stamp of approval. The same way many organizations, like obviously we talk about the Project Management Institute with the PMP, and there's many other certifications like the Six Sigma certifications through the American Society of Quality. And no matter where you are in the world, an employer sees that and it takes a burden off of them from doing another a standard test that they created to assess your competency, knowing that you're already coming in with those assessed. Imagine if you're a clinician or a pharmacist, and every time you apply for a job, they have to put you in a pharmacy to see how you do 
before giving you the job. When you provide your degree and your license, they assume that you come ready made and we don't need to get into all that, right? So we definitely need that for public yeah. health. Yeah. I think I've developed an even more strong opinion as we've spoken. Are you feeling the same way? I think so. I think it has the potential mm. to be a good thing. I think, in my opinion, being in the public health space for many years now, we almost face like a cri an identity crisis, identity crisis, right? People don't know what public health professionals do still, still. even after COVID-19. And maybe after COVID-19, it's more of a very limited view about what we do. And there's many negative attitudes towards public health as a result of COVID-19. So I think that if there is the potential that a certification, a unifying certification like the Certified in Public Health certification can unite and more clearly define the roles, the responsibilities, the competencies of what a public health professional is, I think there is a lot of potential there. And I would want to see something like that happen. I agree. This was Gordon and LaShawn <laughs> talking about standardizing some kind of certification for public health practitioners. Of course, there are bodies and institutions already doing this work. And we seem to have some agreement about wanting to see how that plays out and seeing if that's a pathway to advance the field of public health, get more visibility on the field of public health, a better understanding from the public about what public health does, a better understanding of from public health about what public health does, right? And in the long run, could mean public health professionals are more highly regarded because there's this rigorous testing that everyone has to go through and maintain their credential, right? So I think in the end, it's something worthwhile pursuing and we're glad that there are bodies and institutions and agencies out there pursuing this, like the National Board of Public Health Examiners. Yeah. Is that right? National NB Board of Public Health Examiners. PHE. Yeah. Shout out to NB yep. PHE. Oh. This was Gordon and LaShawn talking about a lot of stuff signing off until next time peace peace this show was edited by me gordon thane with additional editing from lashawn benedict sound design and mixing by myself and lashawn benedict the original music from the music room composed by tom fox licensed from johnny harris the cover art design for our show by lashawn benedict the Public Health Insight Podcast is produced by PHI Media. Thank you for listening to the Public Health Insight Podcast, your go-to space for informative conversations, inspiring community action. If you enjoy our podcast, be sure to subscribe and leave us a rating on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. See you in the next one.